this will be on cardiovascular outcome trials in type 2 IBS. Lessons learned from the perspective of my world, which is cardiology. And here you have my declaration of interest. And let's start with an historical perspective on this. We all take cardi cardiovascular disease for granted. But before the invention of insulin, actually people died without cardiovascular disease, all of them. And we didn't know about it. It took some time before we understood that the invention of a new drug and several drugs by the time caused a problem, microvascular and microvascular complications. And um, it was soon understood that the higher, the worse. This is a slide from the classical trial, um, UKPDS, where you can see that almost everything evil that can happen in the vessels and with the heart uh, gets worse by increasing HbA1c. So the first lesson that we learned by invention of glucose-lowering drugs was actually that new treatment may cause unforeseen problems. Well, some very ingenious character came up with the idea that if something is bad when it is high, it must be much better when it's low. So people started to look at the impact of glucose-lowering on cardiovascular outcomes. And uh, it took some time, as you can see, before the first publication on that came. 1993, insulin was invented in 1921, and the first patients treated 1922, and the Nobel Prize awarded that year. Here you can see that there is a decrease in both macro and microvascular complications by reduction of glycated hemoglobin by approximately 2%. But you can also see something else. It takes time not only to get the first publication of this, but also before you can see any impact. Seven, eight years on the macro side and about three, four years on the microvascular side. Have that in mind when you look at the modern trials of glucose-lowering drugs. But the next lesson is a duplicate le lesson. It takes time. Glucose-lowering in type 2 diabetes is different, actually. And uh, if you look at type 1 diabetes, it's actually something which is caused by insulin deficiency. You don't have insulin. But type 2 diabetes has long been compared in a way which I think we shouldn't do anymore. And this is one of the most recent meta-analysis of several trials made on glycemic outcome if you lower glucose. Here you have the results for microvascular. And as you can see, if you look at dialysis, if you look at renal death, blindness, and clinical neuropathy, there are no overwhelming evidence that tight glycemic control, at least not as used in the trials that you have seen, had any impact on this in the final end. If you look at the macrovascular point, you can see there is one thing, and this is down here. You have about 10 to 15 percent reduction of non-fatal myocardial infarction, but all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, stroke and amputation is actually not interfered with in the trials made so far in these, tri uh, these trials of glucose lowering more intensive compared to less intensive. So what about this? Well, we tried in the Degami trial many, many years ago to use insulin in post-myocardial infarction patients, and we actually reduced mortality. And uh, the UK PDS did so too, with metformin, for instance, and sulfonylurea. There was a favorable outcome. Then we tried to repeat that in the Degami second trial, and we couldn't do it. And later on, there was accumulating evidence of safety concerns. And this, these trials were done before the area of statins. They d were not invented by that time. And before blood pressure lowering drugs of any modern character. And actually the only risk factor for cardiovascular disease that could be interfered with was the glucose by that time. Later on, the background therapy was defined. And if you look at, for instance, the famous Stino 2 trial, about 70, 75% of the impact of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality was related to lipid lowering when they tried to translate that into some risk engine made up by the UKPS Oxford risk engine. And the safety concerns came up as roaring lions in glucose lowering world, and we had to take that into account. So the third lesson is that glucose lowering seemed to work when no other remedies, no other treatment could be done with risk factors, but glucose lowering drugs may actually cause harm rather than benefit.
So what about the side effects of old and novel uh, new uh, glucose-lowering drugs? Well, there are many. This is just a list from the European guidelines on cardiovascular, uh, on, on diabetes and prediabetes. And uh, the next lesson is, of course, that the glucocentricity had to be abandoned and potential harm accounted for. And that was done by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the European Medical Agency by inventing this superior, non-inferior, inferior and unproven effect, as you have heard so much about. And let's take a look. Recent cardiovascular outcome trials with glucose-lowering drugs are very many. You have them listed all over here. DPP-4 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, even insulin. And you have heard about the outcome from some, and you will hear about the outcome of several more studies in the next few years. But let's take a look at what happened. And we, let's look at the typical study. This is the first one published. It's on saxagliptin, and it's people with type 2 diabetes at very high risk for cardiovascular disease. They either have the disease or very much risk factors. They are very many, as you can see. And the treatment is either saxagliptin or placebo put beyond ordinary treatment. The follow-up is very short if you remember the time it takes before you impact something with glucose-lowering drugs in the early days. And the glycate and hemoglobin by the end of the study does really not differ much between the two groups because it was allowed to titrate in the group who got placebo. And here we have the non-inferior result and observe 2.1 years and actually not much of a difference. So this is not a test of glucose lowering. It's just a test of a drug on equal uh, uh, level as the other. But whoops, here we have an unexpected finding that you heard about before. This came as a big surprise. So the sixth lesson is that unexpected thing, findings may still appear when you test new drugs. Let us summarize what has been published on some Saver, Examine, Tecos, Elixir, and Excel. You have heard about them. And they are all done in the same type of patients, all with the same type of very uh, short follow-up, all with a composite cardiovascular endpoint, and all are non-inferior, non-superior uh, of, of these different drugs, which are DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. So until then, we were a little bit uh, pessimistic. The brilliant idea then. What about the brilliant idea? Why didn't it really succeed? Well, first of all, what was actually tested? No pleiotropic effects of tested drugs. This is not a test of more versus less glucose lowering. It's a test of a number of compounds which lower glucose and which doesn't have much more effect on the cardiovascular system. Diabetes is actually more complex than just dysglycemia, as you can see here and you have heard before. It's a lot of things. It's inflammation, it's dyslipidemia, it's uh, more of thrombotic propensity and less of uh, dissolution of thrombotic uh, established thrombosis. The growth hormonal system is, is not completely normal, and the thelial function dysfunctions and oxidative stress is a problem. So the relationship between cardiovascular disease and diabetes is complex. Glucose is not the true and definitely not the only problem. One thing that we have to think about in the future, for instance, is this UK study of a huge number of people with diabetes. As you can see, their first manifestation of uh, a diabetes complication is peripheral artery disease, second heart failure about the same, stable angina pectoris. Here you have myocardial infarction and stroke, which are essential components in the endpoints in the modern glucose lowering trials. So why didn't they look at this? This we have to look upon in the future. So short periods of follow-up, we have talked about them. Very um, endpoints need to be revised in the future trials. Otherwise, we probably are lost. If we look at the cumulative number of patients, this is the year when the FDA uh, came with this uh, important non-inferiority demands. And a lot, lot of patients have been in introduced in these trials, as you can see. It means that these are resource demanding and costly trials, and fortunately we got something out of it, despite that they were not constructed in a way that had a chance to show superiority actually. Study populations were all with cardiovascular damage. They were rather ill, the populations. We will talk more about that shortly. 
Long-term benefits and risks are not elucidated at all. Maybe that if we have continued five, ten years with these trials, something would have happened. And some, something would, might be benefit, but also a drawback. We don't know anything about that. Few head-to-head -head comparisons. We are waiting for the first one in the SU versus SGLT2 inhibition, as we have heard about before. Firm endpoints are needed. Surrogate markers like glucose is insufficient. And these are actually market and re regulatory driven research rather than academically invented trials. Because the drug companies take many patients during a short time which are very ill, which accumulates endpoints very quickly, and therefore they can say it's non-inferior, we can sell it on the market, but we don't know actually how valuable it is or not. Then something happened. The trial design is, of course, as a lesson in need of a revision. What about any new ideas and future hopes then? Well, I have been very depressive so far, so let me be a little bit optimistic. We have actually got some, you have heard about them, the SGLT2 experiences and the GLP1 ones, and they have been so thoroughly investigated. I just want to emphasize a couple of things, but new treatment may have unforeseen beneficial effects as well as drawbacks. So what you have seen here are two trials with two completely different compounds which have about the same impact on cardiovascular composite endpoint here, if you look there, you have a 14 versus a 13% reduction. One is a very quick onset and continuing effect, and the other one slower onset and mortality driven. The first one is heart failure driven. So it's quite interesting that all of a sudden, without nobody knowing anything about it in a trial that was not designed to show any positive effect, we got something. So here we have drugs with what we can talk about as pleiotropic effects. Here you have a summary of the trials. You have sustain and leader here, the Empareg and Canvas here. The same type of endpoints, the follow-up here are also short. Remember that. We don't know about the true long-term effect. The benefit we can see in the curves are that they are separating all the time through the studies. So a little hope for continued benefit, we don't know. And then you have something interesting here. These are the attained HbA1c levels. And this means that the next lesson is that an HP1C between 7 and 8 seems reasonable, at least from my point of view, who want to save people from cardiovascular events. And uh, less than that is perhaps not needed, perhaps for microvascular, perhaps for type 1 diabetes, but obviously not so far for type 2 diabetes. Do we know anything about the effects? No. As said repeatedly here, we don't know, we don't have the foggiest idea. We can speculate on a number of things here. We have to do studies on 70 patients instead of 7,000 patients. And these studies have to be extremely thorough. They have to be with MR technology, with uh, look at vessel elasticity, many, many things that you can never ever do, biosamples, which you cannot do in large po patient populations. And fortunately, some uh, studies are ongoing. These are what has been speculated about SGLT2 inhibition, and some of this may be right, and some is probably wrong. I think the green ones here are the most expected outcome, the renal mediated effects. And if you want to have uh, another aspect on these, it comes here. These are classes or individual drugs that have been studied. This is saxagliptin causing heart failure. This is citagliptin not causing heart failure. Both are called DPP-4 inhibitors, but they are obviously different. And why use this one when you have that one which is safe? Although we don't know really why, and I don't think it is a play of chance actually. And the same goes for the GLP-1 receptor agonists which are all in one class but which have definite differences as uh, just recently outlined by previous speakers. So in principle, the lesson for a clinician is we cannot trust class effects. We have to look at trials done and use the drugs that has been used in these trials for the time being. What about reality? compared to studies. This is all patients in Sweden with a myocardial infarction since 1995 until 2015. This is the one year mortality. And as Navid said in the beginning, there has been a beneficial effect 
on mortality in both groups, people with diabetes as well as no diabetes. And as you can see, unfortunately, there is still a gap between the two. One reason for that is, and I'm not going to talk about it today, but when we investigated the target-driven treatment of people with diabetes, it's rather lousy. They are not really treated to the blood pressure, lipids, etc., etc., that they should be. That is part of the difference. The other part of the difference is that we don't have good drugs for them. And now, all of a sudden, we got something that could perhaps break this one down towards the red line. But what about one-year mortality in the trials that are so spoken about as in very, very high-risk ill people? One-year mortality in leader and emperor is down here. So actually, we are not treating the very, very ill patients. Reality is worse than trial designs. And of course it is, because you rule out patients who seem to be a little bit too vulnerable. And this is the beauty of being a physician. You have to decide whether the trial results made in somewhat less ill people fits your really bad ill people. So it's still charming to be a physician. Otherwise, it's just to do as the trials do. And that is not charming. So clinical trials and clinical realities are not necessarily the same. And it also means that there is an open question, what will happen if we treat people less ill? If you look at the breakdown of the Excel trial, for instance, you may see an indication that the very ill are better treated than the less ill patients. And therefore, upcoming studies, like the Dulaglutide study, Rewind study, and one of the, uh, uh, the GLP-1 receptor trials, which have many patients who are less ill than in the EMPA-REG and the LEADER trial, they will release their results within a couple of years, and it will be very, very important to see what about those who were not that ill as those already treated. So, future implications then, from a research and a clinical point of view. Well, EMPA-REG and LEADER are true paradigm-shifting trials, without any doubt. They will cause a lot of research, a lot of clinical investments, and a lot of good things uh, in the future. Empagliflozin and Laraglutid are preferred second-line drugs in patients at high risk, in my mind, and already in a number of guidelines for how to manage people. A reasonable HB1 target, at least from my perspective, seems to be somewhere in between 7 and 8. And DPP-4 inhibitors are safe, so if you'd only want to lower glucose in the future, you can use them, but perhaps avoid some in the heart failure-sensitive population. And you have an immediate possibility to treat a sizable and vulnerable patient population, but it's up to your clinical skills to show them which one and in which, with which drug. On the research perspective, you can say that increased interest in mechanistic studies, thereby re refining treatment. Perhaps you can find the exact mechanism and do another drug which is much more specific than those we have just now. I hope so. Explore the potential to treat heart failure patients with SGLT2 inhibition, or even those without diabetes. That is ongoing in the Emperor program. Explore the possibility to treat IGT patients with, without cardiovascular disease with a GLP-1 receptor agonist is perhaps an interesting thing. And to initiate trials in diabetes patients combining GLP-1 receptor agonist, which imme acts immediately on a heart failure perspective, uh, sorry, uh, on, on atherosclerosis, stabilizing and long-term effects with the SGLT2 inhibition, which has a more rapid onset of action preventing heart failure and then to explore possibilities to prevent cardiovascular complications induced by dysglycemia. So let's end by that. This is from a huge study that you all have heard about. It's, a, it's the Emerging Risk Factor Collaboration. Very many patients, very many events, very long follow-up. And as you can see here, glucose is fairly safe down here, but then it's a linearly increase. These are people with diabetes at baseline. There is, as with lipids, a linear increase in risk for uh, coronary heart disease by time. And we are dichotomizing this. We are actually erroneously dichotomizing and say, my dear patient, feel safe. You have 6.9 today. Congratulations, you don't have diabetes. Next week, 7.9, sorry, go home and write your testimony, you have diabetes. This is obviously fake. 
It's a continuous risk factor, and you have to evaluate that in the perspective of lipids, hypertension, smoking, genetics, whatever. If you look then at what happens to these patients, it's the all patients suffer, but patients at low risk, females, patients with younger patients, patients who don't smoke, and patients with a low blood pressure are those who are most at stake with uh, increasing glucose levels. So those who deserve to link love are actually getting their lives shortened by this. Now let's go back to this complicated slide and let's look at insulin resistance instead of glucose. And what causes insulin resistance? It causes dysglycemia, hypertension, dyslipidemia, endothelial dysfunction. It in activates inflammation and it is a thrombogenic thing. What can counteract insulin resistance? Physical activity, insulin sensitizing drugs like pioglitazone. And the concept of lowering has been tested in the Dai Qing Chinese study where lifestyle actually over a period of 20 years in people with impaired glucose tolerance at the start were lowered, mortality was lowered if they did not develop diabetes by lifestyle interventions. Proactive was in patients with cardiovascular disease, very ill, and iris, let's look at that. Iris was performed in patients who had a cerebrovascular episode and they had uh, increased insulin resistance. And they were all put on uh, either pioglitazone, sorry, this is the Dai Qing study first. I, here you have the cardiovascular mortality. Took time, as you can see, but the intervention <coughs> lowered mortality and all-cause mortality was also lowered, as you can see. The IRIS study was done in people after an ischemic stroke, quite a few. And they actually, uh, some of them had coronary artery disease, not very many. But when they were put on pioglitazone versus placebo, myocardial infarction was less in the pioglitazone group who got the insulin sensitizer over time. And it had an impact on myocardial infarction type 1, which is the one spontaneously occurring all of a sudden in your life. Type 2 is the one who are created by interventions, for instance. So this is very interesting and very promising for the future. If you then look for patients, this is 2,395 people without known dysglycemia and without any cardiovascular disease manifestation. But all of them are treated for hypertension or hyperlipidemia. And they are all Europeans from 23 countries. 39% of them are dysglycemic if they are screened with HbA1c and oral glucose tolerance test. 19% had diabetes, 20% impaired glucose tolerance. If you only use HbA1c, you would only have catched a few of them. Fasting glucose was the single most efficient uh, test, and, but the two-hour OGTT was even better. And these are the patients who had not yet developed any cardiovascular disease. This is an ideal population, of course, to test if you can prevent them from getting cardiovascular disease. And the iris results should actually stimulate for you to screen these patients and try different drugs, maybe uh, pioglitazone, may also be GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitors, and further studies are urgently needed because what we are doing is that we are looking for the ill. We love the ill patients. We love to treat patients who are still uh, hit in a way that they are very difficult to rescue over many years. We ignore those who deserve to live a long life. We don't do any studies on them. Why? Because it's expensive. It takes a long time. Fathers and mothers have to start these trials. Uh, sons and daughters have to read out the results in the future. But it's probably worthwhile to try. Look at the Chinese, 20 years of follow-up, very persistent, very well done. And let me um, finalize this. Uh, to say that it's time to abandon a purely glucocentric approach, treat the patient, not HbA1c. <laughs> Thank you very much.